Hello, everyone. This is uh, Keith Reed from Device Pilot. Uh, welcome to our webinar on preparing for scale. I'm just going to give it another minute or so for people to join, uh, and then we'll get cracking. While we're waiting, just to let you know, um, feel free to use the uh, chat or question window uh, in the side of your webinar software to uh, raise any technical questions or any uh, any questions around uh, the content. What we'll do is uh, uh, collect those there and then uh, cover them all off at the end. Uh, but if you are having any technical problems, uh, do please get in there as well uh, and somebody will assist you with uh, with those. Okay, let's get cracking. So uh, this is a joint webinar with uh, um, with a couple of speakers. Uh, I'll introduce those in a minute. So we're going to talk about you know, preparing for scale and in in four sections there around around the relationship between connectivity and scaling, um, around some of our experiences of of what can go wrong, uh, around the relationship between scaling and quality, and and then also some. Uh, some thoughts on the processes that will enable scale. Uh, so my name's uh, Keith Reed. I'm uh, CEO and, and head of product for Device Pilot. Uh, previously, I uh, led uh, a, a product called Actix Analyzer, which was around mobile network optimization uh, around the the world's networks, mobile telco networks, and that's where I met uh, Des. Uh, hello, uh, good morning to anyone in the US and good afternoon to uh, the folks in Europe. Uh, I'm Des Owens. Uh, as Keith mentioned, we met uh, 20, maybe 20 years ago in Actix uh, and I started the US operation with a small team uh, for that business and then uh, was involved as an investor and a uh, executive member of a a business called Metrico Wireless, where we did a lot of uh, mobile phone testing and device uh, launch activity for AT&T and T-Mobile in the US. And about a year ago, I teamed up with a couple of those uh, colleagues and we founded a company called Epitero. Uh, and I'm happy to be here and uh, uh, to share this webinar with you. Um, so when we think about uh, scaling, and I was talking to Keith uh, and Pilgrim about uh, you know the IoT scaling problem, uh, my first thought was to sort of think about it from the perspective of well, what you know, what are we really talking about in scale? And it isn't to me; it's not necessarily about an organization's size. It's really about its uh, organization's impact and the impact that the organization can have in the market and on people is a very much a function of how connected it is um, and you know i i would encourage a business uh, particularly an early stage business to think about its connectivity as a strategic uh, element of its plan um, you know when you're connected it enables speed and certainly a product or an idea or a service can't go viral if it's not part of a connected infrastructure and a connected business. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a very important part. And then when I, I look at that in the context of our own business, just to sort of perhaps illustrate what I'm, uh, what I'm alluding to here, uh, Epitero started in February last year. Uh, we spun out a product line and some intellectual property from a bigger company, but we, we really only got going uh, just 13 months ago. And in that time, we have uh, sourced a number of hardware uh, units for our business directly from China. We use an Android um, PC or Android TV uh, box in some cases and some uh, other parts for our, our product offering. But the fact is we we're able to reach right through into the uh, manufacturing facilities in China and source directly um, you know, the components and the hardware that we want. We have, had, we have a couple of software development teams, a small team in India doing some work for us and a small team in uh, Eastern Europe uh, that does a lot of uh, technical development, Android expertise, data, big data expertise. And we have 
deployed our solution across the US. We have some deployments uh, fairly early stage, but in Brazil, in the UK, we're working directly with a big airport in Hong Kong. And uh, in the United Arab Emirates, we have some deployments through distributors and partners. And in terms of our partnerships, we have a partnership, obviously, with Device Pilot, which is uh, why you know, they invited me, kindly asked me to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, you know, we've, we're a customer of Amazon. We're using their infrastructure around the world and Tableau uh, as a reporting platform. And we have a few distribution arrangements in different countries to help us uh, achieve scale. And this is all done with you know, a handful of employees. And I think that's, a, that's an important point when you think about scale. Uh, yeah, and it's largely come about because you know, the people are connected and we're leveraging those, that connectivity and those relationships and making use of you know, a truly global pool of talent. And one of the things we're obviously able to do is sustain that connectivity through the use of technology. Uh, just simple things that we use every day, Skype, go to meeting, phone calls, emails, Zoom, all those platforms. Now, they, we may take them all for granted, but 10, 15 years ago, that was not really very, very possible. And I think that's a, a, an important aspect that we should be thinking about when we look at our businesses and we think about how can we achieve scale. It's not just about the product, it's about scaling the business. So uh, with that, I'll hand over to Keith. Uh, Thanks, Des. So yeah, I think uh, to continue that theme um, around, connect, around connectedness. So, uh, you know, we found in particular that as a SaaS business, we we use a lot of other pre-scaled SaaS solutions. Those are those, those enable us to pick up things that are already pre-scaled and use them in a, again, even as a relatively young company, do things at scale in a, in a much easier way than would, otherwise, uh, than would otherwise be. And we run our whole business on a set of SaaS applications that are all linked to each other. And the reason why these SaaS applications all work together well is because what happens is ecosystems emerge in various areas that allow these SaaS programs to work together. So in our example with AWS, for instance, um, AWS IoT is becoming probably the most common platform to bring your data from your device to the to the cloud. And, and that's creating an ecosystem around it where we can plug into that data easily in a consistent way in the same way for a large number of customers and that those ecosystems emerging definitely create opportunities both for the customer and for us as vendors frankly where you, you know, more value can be delivered for for less cost and effort um and again you know we're we're using the latest sort of serverless type uh methodologies within aws which which are significantly more elastically scalable than than doing things previously with with sort of ec2 instances or whatever um and uh my ceo program likes a bit of anglo-saxon in his presentation so if we have very you know this idea of uh, yeah, we we can occupy this global niche a particular global niche which i'll describe in a minute but the, what we, we can do that for last we can do that a hundred percent and and go right in and deliver it this stuff at scale even as a relatively young company because of because of these connectivities so uh so briefly i mean most of you some of you know what we're doing already so you know the the premise for our company is this business of connectivity is that is that all companies with products will connect them that's that's ultimately our premise and they'll do that you know not not to sort of add an extra feature to the premium range of the product which some companies have been guilty of but it's it's much more about transforming business models in particular from product to service not exclusively but that's certainly a very common one and we're seeing just amongst our current customers and engagements an incredibly varied set of places where connected product makes sense in all sorts of ways that are that are not obvious and and that are transforming you know, industries by um, by delivering this connected solution. Um, and it is again our premise in terms of the sort of purpose of our business that. 
that whilst these whilst these applications are incredibly varied, the the basic challenges they have in terms of getting them scaled are going to be similar, and and that we're going to help them solve those those things. Um, and so, yeah, we feel obviously that IoT and, and connected products are going to be a, a massive market, and we're trying to identify a sort of thin horizontal slice through that market around operational management. Uh, so now, it's not always not always a not always a, a a happy journey. This idea of scaling, there will always be challenges. Uh, so the question is, you know. What are the different things that can go wrong? Uh, I mean, in short, as it says, they're really, you know, the thing about IoT and connected products is those these devices are out in the real world. Some of our customers are devices on the pavement. They're sat there in the rain. They get, you know, crashed into by lorries or whatever. I mean, there are there are so many different ways that a connected product in an uncontrolled environment can go wrong that, you know, there's just no way to handle them all. Uh, what you often find is that that the this idea of the happy path, the 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 path where the device is working correctly and everything's going as expected. Um, generally, what we find in our customers and 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 with Pilgrim's experience getting Hive to scale is that, you know, like a hundred to one of the code is around these exceptions. It's the it's the the ways it goes wrong cause you all of the cost and effort and pain, not the way it goes right. The way it goes right gets solved pretty quickly. Um, and that making that, uh, you know, making these changes, making your your team build this 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 solution that can that can scale, does affect your entire team. It is a it's a you know a, a, an IoT connected proposition, an interesting one because there are sort of embedded engineers and comms engineers and cloud services and big data and data scientists and web developers and app developers and all of these people go together to build the connected proposition and they all need to be thinking about this this this, this concept of scale um, uh, and clearly that, that any way of doing it manually just just really doesn't scale uh, at all there's yeah thanks Keith yes so um when I was looking at what can go wrong, I was thinking back to uh, some of the experiences we are having and we have had, and I sort of organized my thoughts into a couple of different areas. There are things that are to do with your external operations that as you scale, you typically are trying to address new markets, new countries, new regions. And with that comes, you know, sometimes sort of previously unseen problems. Uh, Today, specifically, we uh, we were asked about last week, one of our customers said, hey, we'd like to deploy your solution in a bunch of airports in Brazil, but your product hasn't undergone homologation. So I'm on the, you know, Googling that, thinking, what the hell does that mean? And, you know, essentially what they're saying, and it's the same in a number of uh, South American countries, you have to put any kind of uh, connected device that uses Wi-Fi or certainly anything that uses license spectrum through a series of certification, you know, uh, processes. And that's a little bit bureaucratic and a little bit tedious, but... Uh, you know, those are the sorts of things that you typically encounter that you wouldn't perhaps expect once you go outside your, your home market. Um, when we look from the US into Europe, we quickly become aware of this thing called GDPR, this big sort of data privacy regulation and initiative. And that puts a lot of burden or, or a lot of burdens on a lot of the, on the companies, um, depending on their size and very much dependent on the type of data and information they're collecting. But if you're going anywhere near somebody's personal information or their IP address, then you need to be very much aware of uh, these requirements. Uh, around the world, there are numerous tariffs and export control activities that you have to deal with, whether it's your own government's, uh, you know, uh, requirements for export or whether it's the destination um, country. But speaking about sort of uh, or bringing that back to scale, you know, th there are solutions available for small companies. Uh, just for example, you know, DHL does a uh, global logistics uh, service. Uh, Amazon have a order a fulfillment uh, service where you can use their infrastructure 
to ship your products and store them in their warehouses and distribution centers and use their Amazon Prime delivery mechanisms as a way of servicing your customers. Of course, it all comes at cost, but uh, those are the things that uh, you, you know, one needs to think about uh, when you're looking at uh, external or scaling your external operations. Then there's uh, some of the challenges that come with scaling your internal operations. And often, particularly in a sort of agile uh, mindset, you know, and in some companies, it's very much about getting something done quickly and failing fast. Sometimes that's at odds with the requirement to then scale because you need to build quality and strength into your both your product and your process early on so that scaling is about doing more of the same, not reinventing uh, the wheel. And one of the things personally I found very important from an organizational standpoint uh, when it comes to growing and scaling and growing quickly is being clear on the clarity or, or having clarity of ownership. Who has what part of this mission? You know, uh, for rapid growth, you need the whole team, and usually it's quite a small team, to be sort of pulling together, and they need to be pulling together on complementary things. There's no, you know, you can't scale quickly if all your resources are all trying to do the same thing, or there's redundancy within your business. Um, so those are those are sort of operational factors. And then the next point is really about your infrastructure. So uh, maybe, Keith, if we could just move on. There we go. So, you know, Obviously, the thing that can go wrong with when one looks at an IoT type of proposition is that you know the volume and the economics of the business is typically quite sort of unprecedented uh, relative to more traditional business models. And you know, until we put lots of things out there, lots of data, lots of devices, lots of connected things we often don't appreciate where the bottlenecks, the points of stress and the points of fracture are going to, are going to come. So, yeah, I think it's important at the very beginning that you, know, one thinks about mitigating practices like how to build in redundancy, how to do offloading, how to buffer and store when systems may not be available or go offline, how to do automated restarts, when uh, you know the systems will inevitably have uh, memory leaks or something and eventually they freeze up and if you build in these protocols and these practices from the beginning and you monitor those systems then you you have a far greater chance of managing that scale than uh, if you just wait until something breaks and then start worrying about how to fix it so uh, those would be some of my uh, thoughts on on what can go wrong uh, as you scale an organization. And it speaks really to the next point about that scale and quality really go hand in hand. And by, you know, everybody says, yes, quality is great. But, you know, if we stop and think about, you know, what does that translate to? I think one of the most important things for uh, technical companies uh, and engineering companies who have a proclivity to enjoy the technology and the complexity is to focus on the ease of use. You know, a intuitive and easy to understand user interaction allows scale. You know, as a simple thing, it transcends language and culture. It reduces your customer support costs and it drives that self-service and self-adoption, that process that is essential for a product or a thing, a service, a business to go viral. You know, it has to have connected properties and it has to be sort of simple enough that pretty much anybody can pick it up and use it and interact with it and get it to do what it's designed to do. And a very specific example I'll come back to, and this is quite a personal one. Back in 2007, I was with the company Metrico Wireless. And one of the things we were doing was uh, testing the user experience, which was a sort of fancy way of saying we were measuring the performance characteristics and the user interaction of smartphones for AT&T and uh, T-Mobile. And we had the good fortune of being involved in the very first iPhone launch. In fact, I have the launch t-shirt sitting in my office that uh, someone from Apple uh, sent to me. But I think the important thing when you look back on that, and it seems perhaps self-evident with hindsight, but 
around that time, the smartest products or the, sorry, the, I'll say the smartest, the competitive products were things like the BlackBerry. And you look at that product, that is a model that was in the market at about the same time. It had 40 to 50 buttons, it had a scroll wheel, it had icons, it had menu trees and structures, and it was very complicated. And lots, and its user base was mostly men or business people who were proficient around computers. And Apple came out with a product which was far simpler. It wasn't easy, but it, in fact, it probably required a lot of you know, engineering to get it that simple. But that was a product that you know, my mother and an entire generation of non-technical people could pick up and use. And it was also well built, but it had a very easy and scalable user interaction. And I think that's often one of the elements that was essential to its success and scale that doesn't always get uh, addressed. And I think it's important or recognized. It's important for us as we're building solutions and we're thinking about scaling our businesses and our products to keep these kinds of uh, lessons uh, in mind. So, uh, yeah, with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to, uh, hand back to Keith. Uh, Thanks, Des. So, yeah, I think we definitely uh, want to reiterate that, that the relationship between scaling and quality. Um, I mean, so another way of putting that, a 1% problem with 100 devices is, is one device, right? No big deal. You know, a one percent problem with a million devices is not, you know, is a is a is a you know, is a catastrophic problem for your customer support team, um, and and so you know, quality really needs to be linked. It's it's how it's one of the key parts of how you're going to get to scale. So I mean, if you have quality problems, you know, they are going to massively drive costs in terms of having to have far too many support people and lots of effort, and of course, you know large uh, amounts of brand damage the the media love a story about a connected product going wrong so you know you're going to be in you know uh, all across the the news if something happens and you know and it's very difficult to see how you get back from brand damage of that nature um so i mean in terms of the internals of what you're building you'll 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 need to be thinking about scale in terms of your internal architecture um you certainly don't want to be constantly refactoring and re-architecturing every time you sort of hit some sort of scaling limit. Um, you generally want to be building for, you know, the next order of magnitude or two rather than the next five orders of magnitude. There's no point building for a billion if you've only got 100,000. Um, but neither is it if you've got 100,000, there's no point building 100,000 because of the time you finished it, you'll have, you know, 250,000 or whatever. So, uh, so definitely... You know, planning the right distance ahead in terms of your architecture is important. And then again, you know, this simplicity and ease of use, as Des has been pointing out, is so, so critical. Your your product just won't be taken up. You know, if we're targeting an early majority, an early adopter uh, area, you know, those the people in that sector of the market might take a little bit of faffing around and a little bit of lack of ease of use at the beginning, especially at the beginning. But I mean, if you want to go to scale, you need to get to late majority and and those people are not going to take any faff. They're just going to give up uh, getting the thing set up if it's that difficult. So simplicity, you know, is critical for, you know, for getting to that mass market area. Um, you know, I mean, uh, an example from from my co-founder Pilgrim's uh, sector of, of of delivering Hive is, you know, that a connected thermostat you know, started off being something about remote control and fiddling around. But really, what you want a thermostat to do is keep your house at the right temperature, whatever that means. I mean, you don't even need to think about it in terms of a degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. You just want to be comfortable, and you want the house to know and and just get it right without you interacting. And that kind of simplicity is hard, but it is what you need to uh, you know to get to the mass market. So we just want to move on to uh, talking about some of the processes required for scaling. So again, I mean, the, uh, these can, you know, your 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 you've got your product and your proposition, but again, unless you've got the process to back it up to deliver it, then then you will fail in that delivery uh, area. So 
obviously there'll be a few areas. I mean, sort of from the point of view of device pilot, we're obviously what the sorts of things we need, we need sort of people for repeatable sales. We need a, a mechanism. You need a mechanism for getting your product to market in a way that's scalable that doesn't involve hiring, you know, one salesman for every 10 sales or something, because uh, clearly that won't scale. Um, and then obviously you need to think about the process for your things, uh, your devices, and, and clearly sort of life cycle as an example. Let me just bring a couple of specific real examples from, from Hive again. Um, so uh, in both cases, this is a, a, the sort of process that could have been a major drag on the customer support uh, team. And in fact, in the second case, became a reason uh, why the customers were got very impressed with, with what they did. So batteries, all of the batteries, all of the Hive devices were battery powered. And so obviously they would need their batteries replacing every now and then. And, and so there was a process where the device reported its battery level. And when it got to a certain level, you know, because British Gas was the, the key customer, they could get access to the, an automated warehouse. So they could trigger, the system could trigger the sending of a pair of batteries to the customer um, and an email saying what they were doing and re reminding them and a link to a YouTube video to show them how to do it, et cetera. And all of that involved no people, no, no, no British gas people, no, uh, no, no alert me people were involved in that process. It was all entirely automated and, and, and didn't touch a human until it got to the customer. Um, now that's a repeating one in the sense that it had to happen every time. The repeater example is a, an edge case one where in a, something like 2% of cases, after the system was installed, a few days later, the mesh network would, would fall over. Mesh networks are a little bit of a law unto themselves, difficult to predict. And so, you know, they could have just put a repeater in every installation, but of course that would have reduced the, the profit margin on, on each deployment. And it was only a 2% case. So instead they identified when that was happening and again, triggered the posting of a repeater from the automated warehouse and an email to the customer saying, we're really sorry, we've noticed this, a repeater's on its way, plug it in anywhere and it'll fix the problem. And again, in 98% of cases, in it did. And so you're left with just the 2% of the 2% that need a customer support action. Um, and so those are both examples of scalable process, you know, removing the humans from the loop and just making the whole thing work really smoothly at scale. Um, uh, at a very low cost and actually delivering very good customer service that people were impressed with. Okay, th yeah, thanks Keith. Um, actually, as, as Keith was saying that, it reminded me of a very real example uh, that we have with one of our customers. Uh, we have a customer called Boingo Wireless. They provide Wi-Fi and wireless services in airports around the world, but mostly in, in the Americas. I think they have some in Europe. And you know, they use our system for monitoring the quality and measuring the performance of their wireless uh, network. But one of the things we did using Device Pilot actually is set up some triggers and some alerts uh, and actions that automate automatically generate or you know alerts and alarms and sends those into their other web service systems. They'll use a service called PagerDuty for their operational execution, their technicians, their response systems. And by simply coupling into that, uh, we can remove the people and facilitate the automated scaling of of the process uh, that we're uh, delivering uh, operationally to that customer. But as I was thinking about sort of processes for scaling, you know, I want, I added one other P to the three P's that uh, uh, Keith had identified earlier, and that is people. Um, often, you know, especially as technical people and engineers, we tend to focus on the product and the solution that we have, and we, you know, and we, we don't always pay the attention to the people that we should. And I would come back to the point that when the product scales and the opportunity scales, the business scales, which means you need to start scaling some of your people. And in doing that, it's very important to be clear again on the ownership. You know, uh, what is their responsibility? What is the result that that person that you're thinking of hiring or have hired should be producing? And if you can instill, if you can give them that ownership of the result, it is very empowering to that individual. Uh, 
uh, and they will typically you know, take a lot more pride and accountability in that work. Um, and you keep the ownership of the solution very close to the problem. If I'm a customer support person and I feel ownership of resolution of the problem, then I'm going to work typically work a lot harder and feel a lot more empowered to solve that problem. It never flows through the organization and creates more uh, and takes energy away from the organization. The other thing that's, uh, I think, actually very important from a management point of view is be clear on what, and think about what is it that you want, what type of behavior or people do you want in your organization? You know, and I was once asked this by a recruiter internationally. He said, well, what sort of person are you looking for? And I said, well, I'm really only typically only interested in two things, their attitude and their aptitude. And he actually said to me, so that's one of the most concise answers I've ever had. I, you'd be amazed how often I ask people who uh, engage us to hire staff, what are you looking for? And they talk, but I don't hear any kind of answer. And I think it's very important if you're uh, growing quickly and you're looking to scale and you want people to help you find the right people, you have to have some kind of definition of what it is you're looking for and what sort of standards you expect in your organization. And then once you've done that, it helps you scale. Um, as we touched on with the product, uh, you know, sim simple is something that can't be emphasized enough. Uh, it does allow you to scale and allow, you allow you to scale quickly. And when it comes to processes, uh, Keith touched on the idea of sales as an example of expanding and scaling. You know, there's a, there's a saying in sales management, uh, at least in some quarters, that, you know, you really shouldn't be looking to sell something to a customer. You should be looking to uh, enable a customer to buy from you. And that's a, I think that's an important sort of uh, mindset because obviously if you're selling to someone, that implies that you have to go to them and convince them. And that requires a certain amount of energy cost and it has certain restrictions on scale. If you can turn that problem, if you can invert that problem and you can get the customers to come and meet you somewhere, they come and buy from you you know, that's clearly a much more scalable proposition. And there are ways to do that, uh, you know, using the technology, using the uh, way you communicate and market and uh, develop your interactions with a customer. Uh, and I think that's an important, uh, important thing for us to think about as we're looking at, uh, you know, at our businesses and hoping that we'll be facing a problem of scale because uh, being successful. Um, so in, in summary, or my conclusion when I look at this is that you, if I step back, there's a, a couple of the key points I'd simply want to make is, although we often as technical people take the connectivity we use every day for granted, uh, but we are living in a time of unprecedented connectivity. And it certainly wasn't the case 20 years ago, and it was much reduced even 10 years ago. And our ability to build a business and leverage that connectivity, leverage that global resource pool and talent pool and the economics of that is very much a strategic uh, thing we should think about as we're trying to scale a business, because the ones that don't use that and you know are unlikely you know to scale uh, as quickly as the ones that do uh and as a simple statement you know i've spent most of my life working with some very clever and very smart engineering people and they do like to build things which is great but you know if you can get it for less and you can sort of then use that energy that effort those finite resources to focus on where you add value. So if, if you can source things uh, for less, buy them in and don't pay more to develop them yourselves. Those would be two sort of key takeaways I would encourage anyone to think about when they're looking at scaling their business and their product. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand back to Keith and uh, yeah, see what he has to say. Thanks, Des. So yeah, uh, so I guess our conclusions are around these uh, these problems, you know, this idea that one percent problems become become really big problems at scale not not small um 
And to address that, you know, you need to think of simplicity as a really key part of quality. Any of those little niggly, slightly difficult things about your proposition at low scale, they all need to be smoothed and ironed out uh, as you prepare to scale because they, they will just, they will drag you back otherwise. Uh, and that's because, you know, doing it manually, fixing those things with a phone call or an email or an interaction just doesn't scale. Um, and so as you're thinking about that, you need to think about these processes that that you have to address the challenges that you will face as you scale. You need to think about those as really part of your proposition, your offering, and therefore they need to be trialed and tested and uh, and really thought of in a similar way. Great. So, well, look, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Des, as well. Uh, I think um, uh, all the registered attendees will get a run through of the uh, webinar sent to them uh, sometime later today. Uh, otherwise, other than that, thanks for listening and uh, I hope to see you on the next one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Keith.